So we recently were able to leave the office and go to a trade show. It's been about 18 months or so since we've been kind of on this COVID lockdown. Mm -hmm. So it's nice instead of having a virtual trade show, this time we physically got to go out and meet people. Yeah, that's refreshing, isn't talk it? Talk to them face to face. Hand them a business again. card for a change. Oh, it, it was so nice to yeah. be able to, to travel again. Yeah. But what we've learned from this past trade show is there's a lot of people that are very interested in learning more about the whole converter recycling industry. Sure. You know, so I thought today would be a good video. We could sit down and maybe educate the viewers on what happens when they sell their converter, when the converters leave their shop? Where do the converters go? What happens? And how does it get recycled back into the circular economy and we get those precious metals back into the industry? So I'm a shop owner. I sell my converters to my local buyer. Mm -hmm. So where do they go? What happens from there? Well, your local buyer probably um, is accumulating over a region and uh, generating a volume. And most of them are uh, reselling in, in the can, buying them in the can or reselling them in the can. Um, there's a few that are um, actually processing and decanting those uh, converters and harvesting the ceramic monolith themselves. Um, but uh, for the most part, there's probably two or three traders in between. Up the food chain, so to speak, right? In between. And then it gets to the company that actually decans the material, the processes the material, and then um, either um, processes it all the way through or um, ships it out for um, assaying and payment. Right. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Let's say, you know, it's, it's been decanned. It gets to a smelter. What, what's the process there? What is, you know, what are the steps that the converters go through? Well, it's a secret process, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what the secret is. Okay, okay? give us the secret. <laughs> well, you know, they have a, a, a series of machines. Uh, it, typically, when the loose material arrives, you know, the, it's weighed in, gross, tear, net weights are recorded, uh, and then the material is processed through a um, a grinding circuit there's various types of grinding circuits could be a ball mill circuit could be um pulverizer high speed grinders pulverizers uh gran granulator type um then they're conveyed um with the conveyance system everything is done either in closed circuit to contain dust or um, there's dust control and dust collectors throughout the process. Just depends on the company that's doing it and how they've set up their operation. But uh, once the material is through the grinders and it has um, passed through the screen to a certain mesh size, you know, very fine particle size, um, typically the stream is sampled with a stream sampler mm -hmm. where they can pull a 3%, 5% cut off the continuous stream of pulverized material um, for um, obtaining samples. And the samples will go um, into the laboratory um, and they'll be split, probably one for the client, one for reserve, another for the processor. And then the processor will uh, run it through their laboratory and report um, the results of the analysis. So then you have the weights on the on the input side at the beginning of the process that dictate um, payment based on analytical results in the laboratory. And so it's just a mathematical equation at that point. It doesn't really take that long um, if you have a lot of people in the laboratory, if you don't have a lot of people in the laboratory, it could take six weeks, eight weeks to yeah. get your analysis. Right. Uh, but a well-equipped laboratory with um, good personnel uh, operating, um, it should it should only take a few weeks. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, and at that point, I mean, now you've got all of this pulverized powder. What do they do with that pulverized powder? Right. That material is going to go into a furnace. And the furnace is, uh, it's a controlled environment. Um, different operations have different operating parameters. Um, some of them will, um, some of those companies can um, add uh, a collector metal 
What would that be? Oh, it could be iron oxide. If it's a if it's a mining company and they're producing um, mine concentrates from a PGM mining operation, platinum group metal mining operation, then uh, typically they are a um, copper, nickel, platinum, palladium, rhodium type of concentrate, and the the host ore from the mine is concentrated to the point where when they are going into the furnace that the uh, the copper and the nickel become the collector metal versus inputting iron ore. Right. Other operations can do that as well. And then um, then the AutoCAD is combined with the material. And if they need to add a little bit of flux, then they might calculate that, input that, and uh, goes in the furnace, it gets heated, everything congeals, and the collector metal begins to fall and grab the precious metals into the into the pool at the bottom of the uh, melt in the crucible, then they typically will tap the furnace, pull the slag off the top, and then when they get to the metal fraction, they'll pour that out, and they'll have all of the precious metals, pretty much 99% of them, recovered in the uh, ingot mm-hmm. or the ingots that they pour. And from there, that has to go to the base metal refinery because you've got copper, nickel, iron. Right. And the base metals are the majority. We always look, you know, in a refining industry, we always look at miners versus majors. Are we working miners or are we working majors? What are the goal? Uh, what are the, what, what's the element mix? You know, we do the analysis and we look and see that it's, it's uh, maybe it's hmm, 5% precious metal, 90, 95% base metal. So that goes into the base metal refinery and they're extracting the copper, the nickel, the iron through various steps. Both metals. Yeah. And it's a hydrometallurgical process. So you went from a pyrometallurgical, you know, melting operation to a hydro, which is a wet chemistry operation. And so now you've removed the majority of the base metals at the end of the base metal refining flow sheet. And you have a precious metal fraction which is uh, high graded. Maybe it's a uh, 20 to 30% concentration. So you went from a, you know, a 5% to a 20 to 30% concentration. That's a good upgrade. That's a really good upgrade. And um, at that point, that material has to go to the precious metal refiner. Right. And that's, that's wet chemistry. That's also a wet chemistry operation, highly controlled. And you, you have to dissolve everything. And there's multiple stages of where you're adding reagents, you're precipitating out your platinum, and then you're precipitating out your palladium, and then the rhodium, and then you get down to the end. You know, if you got your iridium at the end, that's one of the last elements that probably takes the longest, maybe four months through that process wow, four months, to recover yeah. the iridium. But iridium is a very, um, when we talk about iridium, it's it's generally just found in South Africa, and it's in low concentrations, and in those operations, it's at the last step. So then they've got, they, they precipitate the metals out. And the metals are precipitated as a, a mud or a black sponge in high purity form, 99 plus percent pure. Wow. And that's what um, the industry consumes mm-hmm. and reuses. They sell that black sponge, whether it's platinum, palladium, or rhodium, back to the manufacturer of catalytic converters. Then it gets redissolved, right, and reloaded onto ceramic monolith to manufacture new converters, right, right, yeah, absolutely. And then those ceramics are encased in a can again, once again. Now you have a new product that's an OEM spec converter, and that goes out to be fitted onto the the correct uh, make model uh, application. So that's that's pretty much the way the whole process works. But you're really looking at a long timeline. Yeah, what is the timeline? The typically? timeline typically is about, I would say, um, four months. About four months from process. the time it gets to the smelter, then it gets through the base metal refiner, then it goes through the precious metal refiner, and it ends up in the manufacturing environment. Whoever's creating the new catalytic converter. So it, at about the four month period, the metals are available to the manufacturer to be reused. So it's about a four-month So it's about a four-month cycle to get to the manufacturer. But by the time they manufacture the converter, you're probably adding a couple more months to that process. And um, then you've closed the loop. Yeah. That's a very high percentage of um, 
precious metal recovered from catalytic converters that are going back into new catalytic convert OEM applications, it's a high percentage. It's, it's got to be north of 70% of uh, what's consumed at the manufacturer, maybe up to 70% or so is from recycled catalytic converters. So the recycling of catalytic converters is a huge benefit to the environment. Yeah. Saving on energy, lowers the carbon footprint. There's a whole lot of benefits. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that you can monetize that and make a a, a profit in the, in the recycling industry aspect. So there's a whole lot of benefits to recycling of the, of the PGMs, the platinum group metals. I mean, let's face it, here in the United States, we don't mine significant quantities of platinum group metals. No. And most most of them are imported, and they are produced, um, what, 80% out of South Africa, and the balance pretty much Russia, yeah. and some in Canada and at, in, in Montana. and uh, But it's, it's, it's low here in North America. And that's why the you know, Department of Commerce has come out with uh, deeming PGMs, platinum group metals, as strategic to our economy. Right. Yeah. I hope that was a Essential. quick answer. <laughs> that was good. That was very good. A lot of insight there. So we just closed the loop on the circular economy and why it is so important to be recycling your catalytic converters and the importance of it. So I thank you so much for your time. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Yeah. Please like, subscribe, share our uh, videos. Thank you so much.